morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. And let me go through some of the announcements we have going on for stuff coming up. We're going to be hitting Easter soon, or very soon, so it's uh, going to be hitting our busy season. And so a lot going on in the life of the church, but let me mention a couple things. And so throughout the month of March, and then throughout the month of April, uh, we will be focusing on the Annie Armstrong <coughs> Easter offering for North American Missions. Uh, let me give you just a, a couple, a little bit of background on that. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. We've been doing Annie Armstrong forever and ever and ever. Uh, but Annie Armstrong lived from 1850 to 1938. Uh, she was a bold advocate for missionaries and their work. Uh, she championed mission support among Southern Baptist churches and helped create a rich legacy of people awakened and responding to God's call to pray, give, and go. And so 100% of your Annie Armstrong Easter offering gifts support thousands of missionaries serving in church planning and compassion ministry. And so when we talk about North American missions, this is our mission field. Uh, the North American Mission Board serves a diverse and complex region comprised of the United States, Canada, and the territories of Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. The population of that mission field is 371 million people. Uh, there are about 350 languages in that area, and the estimated number of lost people in that area is 281 million people who don't yet know uh, about Jesus. And so uh, your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering support more than 2,400 missionaries and their families and enable hundreds of churches to be planted and thousands of disciples to be made. Uh, and then uh, North American Mission Board and Southern Baptists came together to add 1,018 new congregations in 2021. And since 2010, Southern Baptists have planted more than 9,400 churches across North America. So that's uh, what your Annie Armstrong missions dollars are going to support. And so our goal is um, $2,000. Our goal is $2,000. We'll be collecting it throughout uh, March and April. And correction from the bulletin, the envelopes are in the backs of the pews instead of in the foyers. And I think they're also in your, your giving boxes as well. And so that's for March and April. Uh, if you chose to receive your newsletters uh, by picking them up here at the church, there are some copies of the March newsletter in the four years. Uh, we're, coming, we're wrapping up our uh, shoebox ministry, working with the Mayus Baptist Church for the Appalachian Ministry in Kentucky. And so if, if you took a box to fill up but haven't brought it back yet, please do so um, by Wednesday, really, is what we're trying to uh, finish packing up the remainder of the boxes by Wednesday. So if you can get it back here by then, please do. Thank you for helping out with that. We have about 15 boxes left that we're going to try to fill up this Wednesday night. We're going to do a spaghetti supper at 6.30 and then start packing boxes at, well, as soon as we're done eating, 7-ish or give or take 7-ish. Uh, but here's, here's some things that, that I still need or we still need to fill these boxes. These are just options, okay? So we need about uh, three washcloths, uh, 12 pairs of socks, 11 boxes of crayons, uh, 15 coloring books, uh, three d -d -d things of chapstick, 14 brushes and or combs, 10 things of Play-Doh, seven jump ropes, seven things of bubbles, seven stuffed animals, seven sidewalk chalks, 10 things of Legos, 10 trains or cars, matchbox cars, uh, da, 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 da. a thing of, of, of like a craft kit or something, just we only have one little girl left in there, so maybe a craft kit, two things of slime, nine packs of colored pencils, eight packs of markers, nine activity books, eight notebooks, some Nerf toys, uh, acne, four acne washes, seven card games like Uno, four water bottles, three baseballs, four deflated balls of punch. So just some of that. 
but we don't have enough to fill up our last 15 boxes without some of, some of that. So if you can bring that by Wednesday, that would be amazing. And so they're going to be delivering these, I believe, on the Monday after Easter. I believe it's the Monday after Easter. Okay? So we have a church council meeting today at 3 in the activity building. We have a local outreach committee meeting today. I'm going to give us 3.30, maybe 4, but I'm going to try to knock out that church council in 30 minutes. So 3.30. And no Bible study this Wednesday because we're doing the spaghetti supper and the peck in the boxes. Uh, everybody be spreading the word about our Easter egg hunt. We moved it to Sunday, April 2nd at 3 o'clock. We need eggs and candy. Eggs and candy, eggs and candy, eggs and candy, eggs and candy, eggs and candy. Uh, our goal is to pass out a thousand eggs. And I feel like we did more than that last year. Does that sound like, like we did more than that last year? So at least that. Which is a Okay, note your wedding invitation for Jamie Gilliland and Donna Collins. Uh, there's RSVPs in the four years. If you want to go, please respond to that. Uh, you see an invitation for the 70th anniversary for Ted and Willa Moore on Sunday, March 19th. Uh, kind of either drive through or, or just stop in uh, anytime between 12.15 and 2.30 on, that, on the 19th. Uh, the Siler City Lions Club has a blood drive. Uh, going on on this Saturday, March 1st, from 9 to 1.30 at Piney Grove Methodist Church in Siler City. Okay, so then the last thing that I'll, I'll have to mention, I, I need you to listen closely, okay? So maybe you've heard on the news, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, there seems to be a new spiritual awakening happening in several parts of our country. Uh, it may have very well started with a prayer breakfast at the Museum of the Bible not about a month ago. And then we see a week or so after that, uh, a revival happening on a college campus in Kentucky. And then that spread to other college campuses across the nation. And then this movie called The Jesus Revolution has come out in the past couple of weeks that is uh, basically telling the story of the Jesus movement that happened back in the late 60s and early 70s, which was probably our last spiritual awakening in this country, and talking about how God uh, moved and saved thousands and thousands of people during that time. And so it all is coming together to feel like God is doing something right now, that he is moving in, in special and, and even miraculous ways and so some of the local pastors and I, uh, praying for this, uh, have decided that we would love for our churches to come together and to pray together and to worship together. And so we're going to do this on Sunday, March 26th. So make a note on your calendar. Uh, on Sunday, March 26th, uh, our schedule is going to be completely different. Uh, we're going to do Sunday school at 9.15. 9.15, so write that down, Sunday school at 9.15 on the 26th, and then as soon as Sunday school is over, uh, we're going to hop on the bus or hop in our cars, and, and we're going to um, meet together with, with other local churches at Tyson Creek Baptist Church for prayer and worship. So note this, this is the important thing to note, there will not be a worship service here on this facility that day. Our, it's a joint worship service at Tyson Creek Baptist in their Family Life Center and Big Gym on the 26th. And so what I would love for you to be doing in the meantime uh, is to be praying for revival in your own life, uh, in the life of this church, in the life of our community, in the life of our nation, that we would pray that, that whatever this movement that seems to be happening on some of these college campuses uh, that, that we would experience that for ourselves and God would be glorified and lives would be changed and people would come uh, to know Jesus. And so that's our prayer leading up to that and that will be our prayer on that day as well. Okay? So our prayer time this morning, I'd like for us to, uh, this week is technically our week of prayer for North American missions. You see listed in or inserted in your bulletin a prayer guide. Today is day one, so start with today. I'm going to read today's, uh, and then uh, if you would just read through it and, and follow.
follow the prayer prompts each day. We'll uh, do it together on Wednesday evening, and we'll do it again to finish it up next Sunday. But if you would do the uh, do it on your own these days in between. So today uh, we're emphasizing Kay Bennett uh, out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, human trafficking emergencies don't happen on schedule. So there's no such thing as an average day for Kay Bennett, director of Send Relief's Baptist Friendship House. The doorbell or phone can ring and change my whole day, says Kay. Chances are that day was already filled with serving meals to those experiencing homelessness, handing out hygiene supplies, leading Bible study, managing training programs, and more. It's this loosely controlled ministry chaos that's most familiar to Kay. I have often said, I found a home with the homeless, she says. My call from the beginning was to minister to hurting people. There's no shortage of hurting people in the French Quarter of New Orleans. People living on the streets are typically dealing with trauma and are vulnerable to being trafficked. Kay says the way to help people in desperate need is to see each one as an individual with a unique story and come alongside to listen and walk with them. God never gives up on us, so we can never give up on anyone else. And our prayer prompts for today, we pray for people experiencing homelessness to be drawn to Baptist Friendship House for help there in New Orleans. Um, praying for human trafficking victims to be able to escape exploitation. And praying for strength and encouragement for the staff and volunteers there at uh, Baptist Friendship House in New Orleans. That's uh, what we'll be praying for today, but also want us to lift up Jordan. We're so excited that Jordan's with us today and feeling a little better, but he still uh, still had a fever the other day and got more tests to do, and, and so we're still praying for Jordan. We'll do that today. And for Abby Polston, she uh, has been at the hospital still trying to hold that baby in, and so we're praying that, that it'll hold on for just another week or two. Uh, and everything will be happy and healthy. And then also want to pray for Donna Emerson, which is Regina's aunt, Gary's aunt, Gary's aunt, who had a heart attack the other day and is doing open heart surgery tomorrow. So uh, Donna Emerson, if you'll write her down on your list. Okay, so let's pray together. And I'll give you a second or a moment or so to pray on your own, and then I'll, I'll lead us in our morning prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the privilege we have of praying to you, of connecting with you, of having a conversation with you. And so as we do so, help us to, to visualize who we're talking to, help us to uh, visualize this connection that we're making and as we express our praise and our worship to you, as we, uh, as we confess our sins, as, as we talk about needs uh, in our church family and, and people in our community. So we, we do pray, Lord, that, that you would be glorified in our time together today. We, we love you so much, and we, we want our worship to be pleasing to you. So we, we express our love and our devotion and our commitment to you today through our worship. And Lord, we, we thank you for uh, the work of missions that the Southern Baptist Convention, the North American Mission Board, uh, is able to pull off. Uh, and we thank you for the support of the Annie Armstrong Easter offering and the, the finances that go to support missionaries and church planning and discipleship and, and such. And so this morning we pray for all of our missionaries in general and the work that they do, that they would be funded, that they would be, um, that all of their needs, both personally and for ministry, would be provided, and that you would give them influence and connections in their places of service. Uh, but we especially want to pray for Kay Bennett this morning and, and the uh, Baptist Friendship House in New Orleans. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, that people experiencing homelessness surrounding that area uh, would be drawn to the Baptist Friendship House for help. 
Uh, we pray that human trafficking victims uh, would be able to escape exploitation. Uh, we pray for strength and encouragement for the staff and volunteers at Baptist Friendship House. Uh, and Lord, we, we, do, we thank you that, that Jordan is uh, home and recovering, uh, but we continue to lift him up and pray that, that you would uh, provide continued healing and give the doctors and everybody involved uh, wisdom and discernment and direction of, of how to, to help them to get better and better and better. Uh, we also pray for Abby and, and the baby, that, that you would help everything to be healthy uh, with them. And we pray for Donna and Emerson in having the surgery tomorrow. We just pray that you would strengthen her body and prepare her body for that and be with the doctors, the surgeons that will be engaged in that, that everything would go smoothly and you would bring it to a place of healing in her life. So Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise your holy name. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray today. Amen. Amen, amen. If you turn with me in your hymn books to hymn number 178, 178, and I have instructions for it and how we're going to sing it. So when you get there, kind of give me a smile and a nod so that we can be on the same page. 178. We're not doing the verses, right? We're not doing the verses, we're just doing the chorus twice, which starts about halfway down the page and kind of to the right. Uh, on the right side of the page where it says, He is Lord, that's where we're going to start. We're going to sing that twice. So ushers, also be aware, it's short. So, all right, let's stand together and sing, He is Lord, hymn 178, starting at the chorus. accept this offering, bless it, and you, that it will be used according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I forgot one announcement. So as the ushers are doing their thing, uh, everybody's invited to our church-wide breakfast on March 19th, so we do need to know how much food to prepare. And so, Daryl, if you'll pass that to Daniel, <coughs> and Greg, if you'll pass this to Debbie, we're going to have two going at the same time, and they'll meet in the middle somewhere along the way.
scripture. Or no, we need to go ahead. Well, okay. Let me read scripture and then y'all hear. We <laughs> Yeah. We went. Looking forward to working with those, those kiddos. So. All right. Our scripture reading is the same that it's been for the last several weeks. So surely you have it memorized by now. So let's say it together from a contemporary English version. Hebrews 12, 2, and if you need to cheat, it's at the top of the page. So all three, let's say it together. We must keep our eyes on Jesus, who leads us and makes our faith complete. Amen. May God bless the reading from his holy word. Now our children will be dismissed.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for just the opportunity that we have to, to worship you. You are worthy of our worship. And so in these next few moments, as we reflect on your word, as we reflect on the life and ministry of Jesus, we just pray, Lord, that you would give us a, a, a just something new. Just teach us something new about yourself, about Jesus, about, about ourselves. Just give us some kind of insight or perspective. And just help us to know that, that you are speaking to us and working in our lives today. And we thank you for that. And we just pray that you would be glorified through our time together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope that you never have to experience this again, but perhaps you have experienced it before. Sometimes when churches are looking for new pastors, they put together pastor search committees, and I've heard of churches that will, uh, before going too far in advance with their search, poll their church members or, or survey their church members to see what kind of pastor that they would, would should be looking for. And maybe you've done something like that before. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but after many, many years, the characteristics of the perfect pastor uh, have finally been determined and recorded. And you're looking at them. <laughs> so here's the perfect pastor. Uh, he is the leader who can please everyone. He preaches exactly 20 minutes and then sits down. He condemns sin, but he never steps on anybody's toes. He works from 8 in the morning to 10 at night, doing everything from preaching sermons to sweeping floors. He makes $400 a week, but gives 100 of it back to the church, and then drives a late model car, buys lots of books, wears fine clothes, and has a nice family. Uh, he always stands ready to contribute to every other good cause, including assisting panhandlers who drop by the church asking for help. He is 36 years old and has been preaching for 40 years. <laughs> he is tall on the short side, heavy set in a thin sort of way, and handsome. He has eyes of blue or brown to fit the occasion. He wears his hair parted in the middle, left side dark and straight, right side light and wavy. Uh, he has a burning desire to work with the youth, but he spends all his time with the senior adults. He smiles all the time while keeping a straight face because he has a keen sense of humor that finds him seriously dedicated. He makes 15 visits a day to church members visits the hospitals and rest homes three times a day, and spends all his time evangelizing non-members in the community, and is always found in his study in case he's needed. Uh, now, I'm really, really glad that you are willing to sacrifice one or two or all of those traits and invite me to be your pastor anyway. The truth is there is no perfect pastor there's never been a perfect pastor uh, because people are people are people. And so in reality, there's no perfect pastor. But Jesus, Jesus was our greatest example uh, of the perfect pastor. He alone was the perfect minister uh, of all time. And look what that got him. He was still rejected and crucified by the religious uh, establishment. So... We're engaged in a study aimed at getting to know Jesus better, but ultimately at building a, a deeper, more intimate, a more committed relationship with him. And to do that, we've been going back through scripture and trying to re-familiarize ourselves with Jesus' story. And so far, we've looked at some of his names and what they mean, what they teach us about him. Uh, we've looked at uh, what he was doing eternally before the incarnation. Uh, we looked at his uh, miraculous conception and his virgin birth. Uh, we looked at his childhood, and we looked at several events of his major events of his adulthood. Uh, and so last week, we began looking at Jesus' ministry on earth. During that time, uh, after he began around 30 years of age and before he was crucified, 
what was he doing uh, in ministry. Uh, we separated all that Jesus did into seven categories. Uh, one, teaching, preaching, and evangelism ministry. Two, rabbinic ministry, or calling and teaching and sending disciples. Three, miracle ministry. Four, prayer ministry. Five, reclamation ministry, and I'll explain that more in a little bit today. Six, pastoral care ministry. And seven, redemption ministry. So last week we looked at the first three of those. Today we're going to look at the next three of those, and then we'll hit on his redemption ministry uh, a couple weeks following that. And so now we also said that as we consider Jesus' ministry, we need to look at some overarching themes that permeated all of his ministry, and such as one, perfectly, perfectly revealing and doing God's will, two, uh, living a sinless life in order to be an example for us, but even more importantly, in order to be the perfect sacrifice of atonement to pay the price for humanity's sin. And three, fulfilling the law by loving God, loving people, teaching truth, and correcting misinterpretations. Four, pointing the way to God. And five, providing salvation. So those are some overarching things that go on throughout all of his areas of ministry. So this morning, let's look at those second, that second set of three. First, let's look at Jesus' prayer ministry. Uh, the gospel writers were very intentional about showing Jesus engaging in prayer. Uh, for instance, we read in Mark 1.35, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. We see statements like that in several places in the Gospels that kind of give us a pattern that Jesus engaged in prayer every morning. He thought it was important to spend time talking to the Father and to the Spirit uh, in prayer. Uh, Jesus also spent a lot of time or a considerable amount of time teaching his disciples how to pray. Uh, on one occasion, his disciples watched him pray and said, teach us how to pray. And so I bet that you can join with me uh, in, in repeating something, praying something that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew 6, 9 to 13, but I bet that you have it memorized already. So let's, let's pray this together. The Lord's Prayer. You ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that's a, uh, one of the ways that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Now what's important for us is to not just learn that as a, as a poem that we're going to quote every now and again, but to learn some of the principles out of that. Maybe we'll do that as a sermon series uh, down the road a bit. Uh, but in that, Jesus wasn't just trying to uh, teach them uh, a, a quote or a, a prayer to memorize and quote. Uh, in that, in other places, Jesus taught about having the right attitude and the right perspective and the right heart behind our prayers, uh, about some of the priorities and components of prayer. And he taught us how to address God as our, as our father in those terms of that father-child relationship. Uh, he taught us about the importance of praying with faith. So surely you're also familiar with one of Jesus' famous prayers, uh, the prayer of submission in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, on the evening before his trials and crucifixion and stuff. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus there in the garden praying, uh, Luke twenty two forty two records that prayer. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, 
yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus was, was praying for strength to, to accomplish that redemptive ministry uh, that would be carried out the next day and asking God to help. Uh, in John chapter 17, Jesus is shown spending time on the evening before his crucifixion praying uh, for himself, praying for his disciples, and even praying for you and for me. Now you might not have seen your name in the Bible, but you are there. Jesus prayed for you as well. And so let me read some of his prayer that, that on that occasion. John 17, I'm going to read verse 1, verse 11, verses 20 and 21, and verse 23, John chapter 17. Jesus prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Holy Father, Protect them by the power of your name. He's talking about his, his original disciples, followers there. But then he skips down. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. So Jesus prayed for you before you were even born. He continues to intercess, uh, to engage in intercessory prayer for you still today. But isn't that awesome? To think that God saw you even way before, thousands of years before you were even born, and he was praying for you and how God would work in your life. Uh, I think that's comforting. I think that's awesome. So during his earthly ministry, Jesus made sure that his followers saw prayer as both uh, a necessity and as a priority. And I hope that you see prayer the same way as both a necessity and a priority. Uh, if you've ever thought you don't need prayer, then go back to the Bible and look at Jesus. If Jesus needed to spend time in prayer, then we have no excuse. We too need to be in prayer. And so that was his prayer ministry. Next, let's look at Jesus' ministry, and I'm, I'm, I don't even know if this is a real word actually, but I'm calling it Jesus' ministry of reclamation. And what I mean by that, Jesus came to reclaim the law. Uh, he came to correct and in turn free people from a legalistic religion that actually kept people away from God rather than helping them to enter into a saving relationship with God. So by the time Jesus began his ministry, the religious leaders of Israel had taken the law of Moses and turned it into literally thousands of rules that people had to follow to the T in order to be considered right with God. And of course, the religious leaders themselves were the enforcers and the judges of these laws. So while overseeing their religious establishment, their structure, their religion, these religious leaders completely missed who Jesus was. The long-promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus came to fulfill all of God's righteous demands and presented in the law and in the prophets for holiness, obedience, faith, love, service, and truth. So Jesus corrected their misinterpretations and cleared up their misunderstandings or sought to clear up their misunderstandings about the law. For instance, if you're familiar with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, that whole thing is Jesus saying, you have heard that it was said, and quoting some of their oral traditions or oral laws surrounding the law, and correcting it. You have heard that it was said, but I tell you. And then he would correct their misinterpretations. He did that. He spoke about murder, about adultery, about divorce, about swearing oaths, about getting revenge, about love for enemies, uh, making it clear that in those cases that 
uh, instead of focusing on the rules surrounding those areas, all those rules that they had created around those areas, it was more important to deal with the heart of the matter and to deal with the attitudes and the motives behind them, to go deeper than just the external behavior and to look into the motivations and the heart behind those, uh, those activities. And so through his actions and through his, his interactions with people, Jesus tried to show the religious leaders and the people in general that some of their rules weren't as important as loving and worshiping God and as loving and serving other people. If you remember a lot of the story of what uh, the religious leaders did not like about Jesus was that, that he was willing to ignore their oral traditions and their rules uh, and, and heal people on the Sabbath and minister to people on the Sabbath. And that just drove them nuts. In fact, once when the Pharisees confronted Jesus about his disciples plucking and eating heads of grain in a field that they were walking through on the Sabbath, Jesus responded by pointing out a couple of instances in the past where that had, uh, were working on the Sabbath had happened and was justified. But then he ultimately declared in Matthew 12, 8, New Living Translation. So you, you think about their obsession with, with nobody doing anything on the Sabbath to keep them from breaking that Sabbath law. Jesus said, Matthew 12, 8, New Living Translation, For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, that really got their goat. Uh, that he was calling himself higher and more important than their laws and rules and rituals about the Sabbath. It was important for Jesus to clarify that there was a distinct difference in the amount of authority in God's actual commands uh, compared to men's interpretations, rituals, and traditions uh, and their staunch roles surrounding those commands. And so Jesus perfectly summed up the law uh, and his, uh, the greatest commandment, the second greatest commandment, in Mark 12, 30, 31. This is the heart of the law uh, that they had created all of these extra rules and rituals around. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. That is the heart of all the commandments, to love God with all that you've got. Then the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not about the rules, it's all about the heart, our love for God, our following his will and his ways, his principles uh, in our hearts and living them out. So instead of following his lead, uh, instead of receiving Jesus, instead of listening and, and, li and learning from his lessons, instead of learning from him, instead of joining him, the religious leaders rejected him and opposed him. Time and time again, throughout his short ministry, they challenged Jesus. They questioned his authority. They tried to trick him into saying something that they could use against him. They tried to discredit him in the eyes of the crowds. Uh, they tried to, uh, to uh, verbally attack him. They called him a glutton. They called him a drunkard. They called him a friend of tax collectors, a friend of sinners. They called him or said that he was possessed by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Uh, they called him a conspirator and a traitor and ultimately a blasphemer. Ultimately, they plotted to kill him. In turn, Jesus was more, more outwardly, more outspokenly critical of the abusive, self-righteous religious leaders than he was of anything else. So it's, if, if, you, if you've ever had to deal with somebody self-righteous that's looking down their nose on you, and you know that, that they're the ones in the wrong and, and you're being humble about it, just read the New Testament of how Jesus dealt with those folks. 
uh, he was pretty harsh on occasion uh, with how he handled those religious leaders about that. So uh, once, after the Pharisees challenged Jesus about his disciples not engaging in their ritual of, of ceremonially washing their hands before eating, Jesus critiqued in Matthew 15, I'll read verse 3, and the, verse, the second part of verse 6 through verse 9, New Living Translation. And why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? <laughs> Skipping down. You cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Ouch. Ouch. It got worse. In Matthew chapter 23, we see Jesus harshly rebuking the religious leaders in a passage that is probably labeled in your Bible as seven woes. Seven woes. And so that's literally what it is. Jesus seven times... Uh, spoke harshly to these religious leaders. Let me give you an example. Matthew 23, 2 to 5, and 13 to 14. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. And skipping down to 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. So in that list of seven woes and other places, Jesus called the religious leaders hypocrites, sons of hell, blind guides, blind fools, blind men, whitewashed tombs, snakes, and a brood of vipers. Why didn't they like him? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. He was tough on those that were on top of the establishment and keeping people from, from knowing God in, in a saving way. It ultimately led to his death. But even that was part of Jesus fulfilling scripture and reclaiming the pathway to God that had been blocked by their oppressive, legalistic, impossible to fulfill works-based religious system that was leading people away from God. Or leading people astray. So part of his ministry was reclaiming the pathway to God. Uh, that had been stolen by the religious establishment. Okay, and then third. Let's look at Jesus' ministry of pastoral care. Jesus truly exhibited a pastor's heart. Or more scripturally, a shepherd's heart. Uh, he revealed about himself in John 10. I'll read verses 14 and 15. And 27 and 28. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus used that shepherd sheep imagery, uh, but is referring to his pastor's heart, to his shepherd's heart. You can insert your name there where it says sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good pastor. I know Debbie. I know Lucy. I know Robin. I know Mark. I know everybody in this room. I know them. And I lay down my life for them. And they listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. 
Isn't that awesome to think that, that he was referring to you? Of course, he's referring to you as a dumb sheep, but minor detail, he's referring to you as, as one of his. Uh, much of his ministry was moved by his compassion and care for people, which we've already seen on display in, in the previous sections that we talked about in his ministry. Uh, we've seen his love and compassion uh, exhibited through his working of miracles, which he didn't do for himself, but he would do to, to show compassion and care for hurting people around him. And also in praying with and for his followers and his disciples. So Jesus' ministry was filled with all kinds of pastoral care activities. Uh, for instance, he both encouraged his disciples and he held them accountable. He uplifted them and taught them, but he also corrected them when necessary. Uh, when the disciples were arguing over which one of them were the, was the greatest, Jesus simply reminded them that he was giving them an example of humble service. He blessed people's children. He defended and served as an advocate for people, such as the woman who was caught in adultery, that they were getting ready to stone that poor woman to death. And with his compassionate heart and his clever words, turned that crowd of harassers away. Uh, he who has never sinned throw the first stone, and there wasn't one in the crowd who could do that. He was an advocate for that woman uh, who was caught in sin. Uh, after revealing the things that were going to happen to him, uh, his arrest, his abuse, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection... Jesus uh, took time to comfort his disciples, his followers. He had told them that uh, he's getting ready to suffer and die and go away. And so then he, he comforts them with his words. John 14, 1 to 3. Hear his pastor's heart. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Can't you hear his pastor's heart uh, of compassion and love and care for his disciples in that, in that conversation? And part of that ministry of pastoral care included personally counseling individuals. Uh, when Nicodemus, one of the one of the leaders of the Pharisees on, on the ruling council came to Jesus at night. Jesus took time to, to speak with him and explain deep spiritual truths, including how to be born again. John 3, 16, or in John chapter 3. Uh, Jesus initiated a conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well that led not only to her salvation, but also to a whole village for the people who came to know him because of his conversation with her. That's in John chapter 4. My favorite was when the resurrected Jesus took time to counsel and restore Peter, who had betrayed and denied him three times as Jesus was being going through that trial that evening. And so after his resurrection, we see in uh, John 21, out on the uh, on a beach, uh, Jesus, and I'm going to read 15 to 18, but I'm going to skip around a little bit in that passage. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Feed my lambs. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And take care of my sheep. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now, I love that passage for two reasons. One, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus let Peter make up for it? Three in that conversation. But also, in that conversation, he expresses his concern for the rest of his sheep, the rest of his people, and telling Peter and other church leaders, take care of people, serve people, love people, care for people. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And so uh, he expressed his pastor's heart personally to Peter in that. 
So in big ways and in small ways, in groups and in one-on-one -on -one conversations and encounters, Jesus always let his compassion drive his ministry of pastoral care. So those are three more areas of ministry that Jesus fulfilled while he was here. In their book, Making Sense of the Ministry, Warren and David Wearsby noted 10 basic statements about ministry. So listen to what they wrote. One, the foundation of ministry is character. Two, the nature of ministry is service. Three, the motive for ministry is love. Four, the measure of ministry is sacrifice. Five, the authority of ministry is submission. Six, the purpose of ministry is the glory of God. Seven, the tools of ministry are the word and prayer. Eight, the privilege of ministry is growth. Nine, the power of ministry is the Holy Spirit. And listen to their tenth one. The model for ministry is Jesus Christ. The model for ministry is Jesus Christ. That's such an important point. So whether you're engaged in volunteer work or if you're a, a, a professional minister, either way and everywhere in between, Jesus is our best model for ministry. Jesus is the greatest minister of all time and all eternity. Jesus revealed about himself in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So with that in mind, that the only way we can have a relationship with God is through a saving relationship with Jesus, with that in mind, this morning, let Jesus' ministry on earth inspire you to put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't done so already, and let it inspire you to do whatever it takes to build on that relationship, to build a deeper, more intimate, more committed relationship with Jesus today and every day. May we daily heed the counsel of Hebrews 12 to, we must keep our eyes on Jesus, who leads us and makes our faith complete. So I'm not sure where you are in your faith journey. I hope that everybody here has already uh, dealt with the fact that we are sinners and separated from God, and the only way back to God is through Jesus. I hope that you have made peace with that and have accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. But if not, or if you doubt that or you question that, uh, you, can, you can make it happen. You can... You can put your trust in Jesus and enter into that saving relationship with him today. So as we sing our hymn of response, and hymn number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, if you need to turn your life over to Jesus to be saved and reconciled with God, today could be the day of salvation for you to come and make that decision. I'd love to have a conversation and prayer with you here at the altar or anytime, anywhere. Or perhaps today the Lord's working in your heart in another way, and whatever that might be, respond in faith and obedience. So as we stand together and sing, hymn number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and respond in faith and obedience. So let's stand together and sing and worship and respond.
that you have sensed the Lord's presence and power and, and his uh, spirit speaking to you today through our worship. And how many, this is, uh, this is a loaded question, I don't know how to ask it without being offensive, I don't mean to be offensive. This movie that I mentioned about the Jesus Revolution, how many of you were aware of that Jesus movement happening when it was happening? Y'all, y'all remember? Were any of you saved out of that Jesus movement? Um, one of the one of the pastors, uh, actually the pastor at Goldston Baptist, uh, who was in with this, was uh, a product of, of the Jesus Jesus movement and saved out of that. So I wasn't sure what it was about when we went to it, but I, after getting there, uh, it was very inspiring. I thought they handled the, handled it well. So. I would encourage you, uh, even if you're not really much of a movie buff, I would encourage you to, to go and see it. Jesus Revolution uh, is playing at the theater in Sanford, I know, I'm sure others as well. Uh, that would be a pretty cool trip, <coughs> trip. If we wanted to do that together sometime, that would be a, a cool trip to, to go grab some supper either before or after and watch the movie together. So just a, just a plug for the movie and to be praying about revival in our lives and in our church and in our community. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your awesome love. We thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, we thank you for just the, the awesome way that you work in our lives, uh, in our church's life. We thank you especially for our salvation, uh, for your death and resurrection. Uh, that, that helped that, but Lord, we just pray that, I pray that, that each and every day uh, that we would just be drawn to you, to, to build and deepen that relationship with you. So bless us as we go. Help us to be a blessing for the people around us. Lord, we do pray for revival in, our, in each of our hearts and in our church in general and our, our community and beyond. We pray that you would be magnified in amazing ways as people to come to know you. And we love you, we thank you. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thanks and God bless. Have a, have a great week.